we have such a, a blessing when we share in devotion as we do in the hymns. So we just had to mention that, friends. We really believe that um, the Lord has directed the Ecclesia here in this subject because the things we see in the earth today can cause us to make our heads hang down, certainly that way in the world. And we have to hold on fast to the promises and keep lifting our heads up as we see the things that come to pass in the earth. That'll be our focus today. Here's our theme text. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up. It's interesting. You have look up first and lift up your heads for your deliverance draws nigh. And brother, that is the hope that really sustains us, being with the master and seeing our father. And then with open hand, being able to bless mankind as part of the Christ. Friends, we have the, you know, the best promises of all, exceeding great and precious, not just precious, not just great and precious, but exceeding great and precious promise. Because frankly, friends, we need those promises in our walk to be faithful. But friends, in our study, what we were really struck with um, on this subject of when these things begin, when you start with that, um, as we study Luke 21, 28, that is the theme of the chapter on the deliverance and exaltation of the church. And it's quite interesting what, what Brother Russell pulls into that. And um, we're going to be looking at some things that um, are, are likely, I think, to be a little controversial. Uh, some of his writings, I think, you know, we look at events in the world, we wonder how these things may happen. We say this because we want to share things in the spirit of dialogue as fellow watchers as to what's happening in the earth, uh, what may yet happen. Well, in that chapter, he addresses the gospel harvest. He places the deliverance and exaltation in the church as the end of that for, for the Lord's people and also the um, entry into the kingdom for mankind as part of those, you know, originally he thought it would be 40 years, but you'll find as he writes, when you look at all of those places, because he emphasizes that again and again, expected the harvest to be 40 years. Just as often, he also put in there that the church would be completed during that time and that the kingdom would be fully ushered in at that point. So we just wanted to give that background, brother, because that's the area where we have discussion a lot uh, today. Uh, we wanted to tie in, when you look at the Lord's Great Prophecy, because Luke 21, 28 comes out of the Lord's Great Prophecy, that prophecy also points to the Gentile times ending, the Son of Man coming with clouds, so it's during the parousia, uh, the fig tree shooting forth, the nation of Israel beginning to, uh, you know, be restored and the people coming back and so forth. And then as the immediate context of our scripture, our theme scripture emphasizes, it's a time of great fear and uncertainty for mankind. They can't understand the things happening in the earth. So this first portion, dear friends, of looking up, um, you know, have you ever had experiences that just stopped you flat and you didn't know, what, what do I do? What is the Lord wanting me to gain in this experience? and you just couldn't figure it out. Well, friends, that is the best time for us to look to our Heavenly Father. And I think that's what this look up is referring to. We have to recognize, first off, the Lord's great omnipotence and his great mercy and love and power that these things that happen in the earth are not beyond his control, his oversight. And frankly, friends, I take great comfort in thinking of the master's parousia, that he is present here on earth, not only overseeing the completion of the church and the experiences that, that we have, but also there are guardrails around mankind's experience. And I think it's kind of amazing that, um, you know, things go as far as they do today. We might think that, oh, this is too much what happened in Israel. And yet, friends, you think about this, those individuals, those terrorists are not unrecoverable. The Lord would have stopped that beforehand if they could not be recovered. So brethren, there's a real object lesson in this, we think, in the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And you know, it's hard to see sometimes how that experience is a gift from God. But you know, it's a lesson for eternity, not just for mankind 
but for other creations. And to really understand, you know, you know, brethren, I, I think about, you know, if you go to heaven, if you're faithful, you go in the presence of the Father, you think of the perfect contentment and satisfaction that there will be there, that perfect harmony. Any sin bars that, friends. And it's such an important lesson. We do not want our own willful way at all. And the world will gain that lesson as well and gain that harmony, not the divine harmony on the divine plane, brother, but they will gain that contentment and harmony also. So friends, we just emphasize the very first thing is in any trial, we have to look to God. And there are people in the world who wonder. I mean, there are people who have some you know, faith that are looking to him. Now, friends, for us, we wanted to emphasize here, it's a looking to God with our whole heart and our whole soul. It's interesting, we were looking at the words for lift in the scriptures, and uh, some of these say, this is Psalm 25, 1 and 2. And of course, this is David again. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift my soul. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. That's really a statement, lift our hearts up, or lift up our souls to God, our whole being, dear friends. There's also um, uh, Psalm 86, the first seven verses is beautiful on this as well. Psalm 86, verses 1 to 7. Well, our theme text goes on to say, you know, we look up to the Lord, we have to lift up our heads. And friends, it is such a... Um, a contrast when you look at verses 25 and 26 and compare it with 28 in Luke 21, Luke 21, 25 and 26. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. And one of the translations points out this is they, they see no way out. They don't see how mankind can get out of the trouble that they're in. The sea and the waves roaring, you know, the masses you, you see, Friends, I think a lot about the scripture, Exodus 23, 2. It says, you shall not follow a multitude to do iniquity. And that's what we see today. You know, it's hard to stand up alone for what's right when the whole you know, group may be against you. But that's what it says under the law. You don't follow a multitude to do iniquity. Again, Exodus 23, verse 2. But that's what we see in the sea and the waves roaring. And men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Friends, did you ever think about that, the powers of heaven being shaken? A heaven quake. Did you ever think about how you have an earthquake in heaven? You know, the spiritual controlling powers um, is what happens there. Now, friends, we, we make this point about Luke 21 and 25 and 26. Have you ever seen a person who is so depressed and so discouraged? They can hardly lift their head up. You know, our text is lift up your heads because we're expecting deliverance. We're expecting blessings from the world. We don't want our heads to hang down. And sometimes our experiences, you know, we have to reorient it from, you know, we don't understand and we're struggling with it. So this is a positive statement to lift your heads up. And we would say here, friends, it is through the promises and realizing the Father's providences over us. Uh, Luke 18, 13 reminds us of this, friends. You know, the publican, when he was praying there by the Pharisee, what did he say? What, what was his stance? He couldn't lift his eyes up to heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, friends. And sometimes our failings and mistakes are the reasons we have trouble lifting our heads up. We have to realize afresh the grace that is provided and how the Lord is for us, how he wants us to make our calling election sure. And he knew we would have failings. It's do we pick ourselves up and continue to strive to serve him? So part of lifting up our, our heads, friends, is really the contemplations we have of the lessons the Lord gives us. I'd like to quote here from reprint 5852, 5852. To Bible students, we merely suggest that if the worst should happen, we should remember that God is at the helm, and thus he will allow human pride and wrath to further work out the great trouble incident to the Battle of Armageddon and the inauguration of Messiah's kingdom. And then he points out this verse. 
You know, brethren, it is no one less than Jesus that says this, to lift up your heads for your deliverance throughout the night. It's his direct advice to us, dear friends. Now, one point we want to make here, sometimes we've heard statements like, you know, God isn't going to beat man into submission, that the trouble's unnecessary and so forth. Well, I think Brother Russell's point is that human society is headed for a crash because of sin. Just as every individual human being dies, so human society, if allowed to go to its furthest length, it would die as well because of sin. So the point is, the Lord, we like to think of it as guardrails around the permission of evil. So he overrules the timing, he overrules the intensity of the lesson, so that it's a full, clear lesson. But it doesn't permit mankind to be destroyed, dear friends. I'll reprint 5062. I'd like to quote from this also, again, reprint 5062. What should be the attitude of God's consecrated people at this time? They should remember the master's words and not be alarmed. And then quotes our text. When you see these things come to pass, lift up your heads for your deliverance draws not. And then he qualifies it, brethren. And I think you all know this point, but it's, it's important to state. This does not mean we should ever act or feel boastfully or carelessly. You know, friends, we're not rejoicing at the world's expense. We're rejoicing because we know their deliverance is coming also afterwards. So, brethren, you know, we have tears of sympathy with what the world experiences, but we also have joy because we know the meaning of these experiences for them and for us too, dear friends. He goes on to say, it means that with quiet confidence, we may look up to God and realizing his omnipotence, wisdom, and love, we may trust him where we cannot trace him and rest assured that all things are working together for good, especially for the church, but indirectly also for all of humanity. Isn't that interesting? Indirectly for humanity, all things are working out. But friends, this is the picture of the people when the first tower in New York City started to fall on September 11th. You know, this is the reaction when they first saw that. I mean, you can see the shock and the fear. Um, you, you really understand that we are living in this day. Uh, brethren, I work with people that it just seems like fear is the main motivator. In I used to work, I should say, with people <laughs> who I'm not quite past that yet. <laughs> uh, but we share this, brethren, because for us, you know, we have the privilege of the Father's confidence. The adversary can try to use fear against us as well. But again, it's an opportunity to fully trust the Lord where we can't trace. Now, there's some very interesting, I won't read every quote, brethren, some wonderful uh, studies. Reprint 1605. Uh, Brother Russell comments on this about men's heart failing them for fear. We'll read one part of this, Reprint 1605. He's talking about how the world sees these things and their hearts fail. And he says, the child of God sees the same things, but being forewarned, he knows their import and their foreordained results. Therefore, he can lift up the head. Uh, brethren, I think it's amazing that God has given us so much to understand of what's happening in the time of Laodicea. You know, the Lord could have just said the kingdom is coming and here are all these blessings, but he talks about the problems that mankind would experience along the way because he knew we would be wondering how can these things be happening if the kingdom's coming. He's brought us into his confidence, in other words, dear brother. He's explained his plan so that we're forewarned and we can be forearmed, that we can be faithful as the troubles proceed in the earth. Uh, we'll mention reprint 5255. I'll probably quote from that later, brethren. It's a wonderful article, very encouraging. We recommend. Well, dear friends, here is a picture. <laughs> Very friends. This is a picture of Israelis, some of them who were abducted October 7th. You probably read, dear friends, how um, this is like Israel's, you know, 9-11, this experience. It's been a real shock. 
uh, you know, friends, all the brethren, it seems like, are talking about this. You know, what does this mean? They're going to search the scriptures and see just where are we in time and so forth. Well, Brother Russell says some fascinating things that I was kind of amazed to come across in this study. This is from reprint 3890. It says, anarchists are probably as sincere as others, but their brains have a different twist from those of the majority. They have lost all hope of the establishment of a reign of righteousness by human instrumentality and in their selfishness and sympathy exaggerate the woes and wrongs suffered by them and others and propose the extermination of the rich. This is what he was saying. But I think we see, you know, it's amazing the hatred that so many have for Israel, brethren. And frankly, friends, I think it's because Israel, you know, they're trying to, many of them, live according to the principles of the law. And it's come to the point where the world, the secular world, hates Judeo-Christian principles. You know, they want to have be free to whatever sin they want, and they see anyone that believes in, you know, living a right life before God as a threat. It's pretty amazing it's come down to this, uh, dear friends. Brother Russell goes on, this is reprint 5852. This great time of trouble will manifest fully that the civilization our day, of our day, of which we so greatly boasted, is merely skin deep, merely a veneer. And I think that's why people are so shocked at what's happened uh, in Israel. You know, friends, we don't often talk about it, but the, when the Nazi party came to power in Germany, Germany was considered the most enlightened nation in the earth. And you might ask, how can it be that a country that seems so advanced and civilized and enlightened could have something like the Nazis develop? Well, brethren, it's really sin. And it, I think it goes to this point about veneer. You know, we've been living, brethren, in a society here in the West. We have had so much given to us, so much wealth and prosperity and peace and so forth compared to many in the world. But there's a veneer here, just like in every other uh, country. I wanted to mention, brethren, this is something I've, I found some real comfort in. Uh, Karen Sue listens to a podcast from Israel from a woman named Eve Harrow. That's H-A-R-O-W. And she made a point about how the world has publicized the atrocities of Hamas. It's like the Lord has overruled all these things, these horrible, horrible things have come out. But she made a point that, you know, these things that happen to Israel, they happen elsewhere in the world. They happen in Africa and Asia, and they're not reported on. And Brendan, that just struck me. Is the Lord permitting Israel to be one that's demonstrating how evil the society has become for men to see really plainly? And this isn't just the Jewish experience, but it's others' experiences as well. You know, friends, the world has a great challenge with Islam. Now, there's a writer, Samuel Huntington, who said his observation was that Islam has bloody borders. Wherever Islam is, and the brethren in Africa have some experience with this, wherever they are and they're not, you know, totally in control, they oppress other religious groups. They do the same with Christian groups as well as, as toward the Jews. Well, friends, there's an amazing uh, question book reference on page 779. Sorry, this is long. Perfect. <laughs> okay. I got a thumbs up from Brother Ed for those of you oh, yeah. on Zoom. The question on 779 is, if God is a God of love, as the Bible tells us, how can we understand his command to the children of Israel to utterly destroy their enemies, men, women, and children? But we'll just quote the part in highlights. Um, Suppose that a people occupying the land of Canaan today were to become so degraded and corrupt that they were a menace to civilization, robbing and massacring innocent people, and in all ways being obnoxious both to themselves and to other nations. Would it be thought unwise, unjust, or unloving for the Lord to cause their removal and entire destruction in order to make way for the establishment of the Israelites in their own land? You know, friends, we have... I think this is part of the looking up when you look to the Lord. Our Father takes the long view. 
Okay. The scripture says that regarding Sodom and Gomorrah, he took them away as he saw good. Brother, he didn't let them go to the extreme where they couldn't be recovered. We heard a brother years ago observe, can you imagine if you were the parents in Sodom and Gomorrah and you came back in the kingdom and you were going to pray for your children and they couldn't be recovered because they'd gone too far, that the Lord stopped that. And the world can't see this, of course, brother. They don't have faith in the Lord to see the long view and how all the hurts of this life. You know, brother, I don't know about you, but I think about the kingdom. Think of someone who died in the Holocaust and what they saw. How will the Lord heal that? We know his mercy and power are equal to that. I guess I want to know how, friends, because it seems so hard today to see these things. But the scriptures tell us they will be recovered and have the opportunity to overcome those terrible experiences. But brother, we want to mention a scripture we think that's really important today is Joel 3. One and two. And this is referring to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which you could um, change that reference to the Valley of Judgment or the translate that. Behold, in those days and in that time, and I shall bring again the captivity of Judah. Th that word captivity is interesting. It's actually um, to bring again their estate of prosperity, what they once had before the Lord. Um, when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the Valley of Jehoshaphat, again, Valley of Judgment, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations and parted my land. Uh, friends, we just look at how the nations oppose Israel. I mean, you know in the news what the UN does. They did one good thing for Israel. They recognized her at the beginning. Everything else since has been terrible. Right? I mean, they say Jerusalem is Muslim. They don't recognize any connection to Judaism, which is absolutely crazy. And the Lord tells them, I'm pleading with you. Here the world is seeing, there are a lot of people so shocked by what they saw happen in Israel. It's like the Lord is giving a demonstration of how unjust the world's society is. Um, a brother may know the name Eli Wiesel, I'm not sure if I pronounce that right, but he's a Jewish man who went through the Holocaust. And a quote of his I, I find really helpful, and I'm quoting this from memory, so I probably get it quite right, but he said, the justice of any society can be measured by how it treats its minorities. What does that say about how the world treats the Jewish people? Friends, can you see how the adversary, why they would oppose, why he would oppose Israel and use the nations? He doesn't want the kingdom. He wasn't going to lose his control. I mean, he's losing his grasp as we go, but he's struggling to hang on. Well, friends, we mentioned when. We'll, we'll touch base on some of these fairly quickly. Um, in the context of the Lord's great prophecy, he mentions about sending his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and gathering the elect from the four winds from one to another. I just, I wanted to establish for the timing because this lifting up the heads, this is really for the church in the whole period of Laodicea. You know, they saw, you know, the scripture says, when you see these things begin to come to pass. And Brother Russell saw the very early beginnings of so many texts that were being fulfilled. I mean, he really was giving us very early information about things that were starting and that we're seeing really strong fulfillments of today. That so started with uh, the harvest time. Um, there's more on that in Matthew 24, 15 to 20. Now, the Luke account doesn't go into um, these texts as much, but you can compare the context and you can see this is the same prophecy that's being related. Uh, Matthew 25, we don't always recognize that's actually part of the Lord's great prophecy. And this is, I think, the thing that Brother Russell recognized when he made his correction on the harvest at the end. It was because of this picture of the door being shut and the, and the idea that the church would be uh, completed. And of course, the, the midnight cry starts with 1874. It was important for the virgins of this entire period to make themselves ready um, to go in with the master to the wedding. Uh, Luke also mentions, it's interesting, he's the only one that mentions the end of the Gentile times. 
And that struck me because, um, you know, what we see happening with Israel today. And this puts the context, brethren, we believe, of looking up and lifting up your heads, especially from 1914 on. We think it's for the whole period. But once the destruction of the old order began, that's when people really began to see fear as a more general society. Some saw things early of, of the trends of trouble that were happening in the earth. Um, catch up with my notes. Uh, friends, I, I like this uh, slide, and you've probably heard me say this before, but it's pretty amazing that the first and second temple were both destroyed on the 9th of Av. And World War I, the event that made it a world war, is when Germany declared war on Russia, and that immediately brought uh, Britain and France in. Uh, that's also the 9th of Av, and to me, that's like a perfect piece of retribution. That the Lord saw how the nations had treated Israel over this time, and part of the Gentile times was his promise that Jerusalem wouldn't be trodden down anymore, and that they would have uh, their corrections as well. I just wanted to mention here, one of our uh, most encouraging promises is Psalm 46 for our day, and I think with the end of the Gentile times, uh, there we see the beginning of the picture of the wind, earthquake, and fire in 1 Kings 19. But when I studied Psalm 46, it was pretty amazing. You can actually compare the elements of Psalm 46 to the wind, earthquake, fire, and the still small voice. So to me, that puts that promise. And, and brother, we just encourage you to you read promises in the scripture. There are a lot that are particular to the Laodicean church. And some we believe that are even more particular to the church since 1948 because of this, this symbology. And um, I don't have them with me, but if anybody wants a handout or electronic, I can share that. Um, another portion of when was the Son of Man coming in a cloud? And I think this goes to the point, friends, that um, the world sees trouble. That's what the cloud represents, but they don't understand it. So, brethren, when we're interpreting prophecy, we're really looking at things that are prominent in the world that they see but we understand from the Lord's word. Sometimes we can focus on very narrow, specific events and think that that is important. Well, brethren, when mankind looks back in the kingdom, they will see plainly what happened when it's revealed to them. So we really emphasize as you study, really look at the trends, try not to look too much at specific events, but at the trends that are taking place. And then the fig tree shooting forth, brethren, this is, this is to me just so amazing. You know, Jesus cursed the fig tree and he said it would be barren. When you look at the word there, it sounds like it would be barren forever, but it actually is an age lasting barrenness when he cursed the fruit tree or the fig tree. So the fig tree shooting forth is a reference back to those that, you know, the nation that was cursed that they would, then it would become time for them to return and be restored. Well, you also have all the trees, all the other nations you know, brethren, to me, this is remarkable. The UN in 1945 had 51 members. Mm -hmm. There's 193 today. Now, Israel was number uh, 59. In 1949, it became a nation. So it became a nation early. Most of those 51 had been around for some time. But there came a time that Israel, brethren, it's almost like Israel is a herald early of the blessings that would come to all. It's it's remarkable that the Lord does these things. Uh, you know, Ezekiel 37, it, it tells how to bring a nation back from the dead. It shows that in symbol. I would also just mention here, brethren, a scripture passage we've been looking at is Jeremiah 51, 19 to 23. I won't go into that. It's something I'm, I'm still studying. But it seems that the Lord is suggesting there that Jacob or Israel is the Lord's battle axe, that the nations, you know, when they come to their final end, it will be because of the nation of Israel. And I think, friends, we can see that the nations rejecting Israel is really showing their unfitness to continue into that kingdom. Of course, they'll all become, um, they'll all become Israelitish and they'll see to Abraham at that time. But friends, in the chapter on the deliverance and exaltation of the church, uh, Brother Russell treats uh, Psalm, or excuse me, John chapter 9. And I wanted to touch on this, friends, because 
this is something I think for years it was very hard for me to understand uh, how the different brethren apply this. But in John 9, our Lord Jesus sees a man who's blind from birth, and he's asked, who's responsible for the sin? Was it something he did? Well, it's kind of hard to think how could he be blind from birth and be responsible for it. So it begs the question, was it because of his parents? Friends, this is really a question about the permission of evil. Why does this happen? How does this happen? And this experience, we think, is kind of like a microcosm of um, mankind's experience. Because Jesus goes on to heal the man, but it's the way he does it that is so unusual. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the context, uh, Jesus spits on the ground, and he takes that wet earth, and he makes clay, and puts it on the man's eyes. Okay. Well, this is from reprint 2670, friends. We really encourage you on this because it, it really helped me to understand this passage. But the point is the blind man is mankind in sin. The day when he says, I must work the works of him while it is day is a reference to the gospel age, the time of the call of the church. And that Jesus spit that comes from his mouth represents the truth. And then the earth, he doesn't take all the earth and, you know, make it wet and put it on the man's eyes. He takes a portion of it, and that would show the call of the church. And those that respond, it's the forming of the church, which is for the purpose of giving sight to mankind in the kingdom. So putting it on the eyes, he likens that to preaching the gospel now, but also in the kingdom. And um, then the man is sent forth to wash at the pool of Siloam, which means fountain. You remember the scriptures that talk about how a fountain will be opened up for Israel and the Holy Spirit will be poured upon them. Um, and then later mankind, Joel 2.28 points that out. So the washing and the removing blindness is all about the period of the millennial age, friends. So when uh, the master said, I must work the works of him while it is called day, for me, he's referring to that development and proving of the church so that mankind can have sight in the future. Now, we mention this, brethren, because he ties in then um, the dark night discussion, because he, he points out that um, a dark night is coming. And friends, you know the scriptures, Isaiah 21, 9 and 10, that um, the morning comes, but also a night. And he likens that to the church having a period of enforced idleness, a period when the door is shut. I mean, you'd have to all study this, brother. There's a lot that he links together in that chapter on the deliverance and exaltation of the church. And brother, we mention this because <clears throat> we don't know what our experiences are lying ahead. And you know, when we don't know, we try to follow what we see the scriptures say. We don't always know just how those things apply or how they'll happen. And that's why we're going to have a lot of discussions prophetically, you know, which is good to discuss and look at, you know, how these various things may be fulfilled, or maybe we don't have the, the correct understanding. But brother, we mentioned this because we think, you know, we've seen an increasing part on the government, especially with COVID, to put restrictions on, I mean, you may have read about in California, there are churches that were restricted from even meeting. Uh, in our area, the city of Urbana, they were debating not allowing any house churches to, to meet. And other brethren have had experiences where there's things they can't do because they're not one of the recognized. Pope Ecclesia couldn't get insurance for a convention one time because we weren't part of the National Council of Churches. It's very possible there may come a time when the church has, has come to the end of her course, and we won't be able to edify one another. And that's, I think, Brother Russell's point about the dark night, that then would be a period of time of standing for the Lord in a difficult period before the world's final experience with the permission of evil. So, Brother, we just bring that up because we think Brother Russell really wanted us always to be understanding of what might happen and to be ready for uh, any experience that <clears throat> that could happen. Friends, there's a wonderful verse in um, verse Thessalonians 4. It's in verse 15 and verse 17 that we believe refers to the church at, at the time of Laodicea. It's called those who are alive and remain. And specifically, this would be 
from 1878 onward, okay, because it's in the context of the Lord gathering uh, the dead in Christ. He gathers them first, and there's this group who are alive and remain. And in that um, chapter on um, in that chapter on the deliverance and exaltation of the church, he points out that the church would be sharing the truth. And uh, it's interesting, friends, that when you study, and this may be some of this may be in later chapters in the third volume, but he breaks down the sharing that the church does of truth. Part of it is kingdom work. You know, we call it planting seeds for the kingdom. Harvest work would be if there are those that have an interest to come into the body, uh, but then also judgment work. And friends, this is not, I don't I absolutely do not want to give the thought, this is saying, oh, how terrible the governments are and how they have to go. I mean, that is not our message. But the brethren have found when you talk about the kingdom, you talk about something so wonderful, all the governments by comparison, they're terrible. And you may have heard this story, brethren, about the Romanian brother, that he was preaching the kingdom. He's hauled before the communist authorities, and they want him to stop talking about the kingdom, and he won't do it. And they said, well, could you say it'll come everywhere in the world but Romania? <laughs> because they knew that the message really reproved their own government. Well, the brother wouldn't. And this was a time when communism was failing, and the jails, I guess, were fairly full. They didn't want to put him in jail, but they had to, because he wouldn't refuse to speak. But in our message, even the most positive things are a reproof in this world. We have to recognize that, I think. I would share with others, sometimes people are wondering, they're scratching their head, what's going on, what do we do? Um, we can explain, too, about why the trouble comes. I wouldn't be afraid of doing that but you always want to focus on the blessing. This poor world, I think about the scripture. We have the privilege of giving beauty for ashes, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The world looks at the church and scratches their head. How can you, you know, be at peace and seeing what's going on in the world? That gives force to the words that we share, brother, when they see that we are lifting up our heads. I'm trusting in the Lord. Well, dear friends, we wanted to mention Isaiah 40, verse 9 uh, through 11. It's quite interesting. Um, you might recall this from the Messiah, those of you that like to listen to. You know, thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. It's a little bit of a poor translation because it's really about Zion class and Jerusalem, what they say, dear friends. And this you can cross-reference with Nahum 115, Isaiah 52.7. The Lord's people at the end, the feet members, is Isaiah 52.7. They're telling wonderful things, good tidings, it's peace, good tidings of good, publishing salvation. And for those who could receive it, thy God reigneth. Nahum does not include that. It's kind of interesting, but, you know, we have such a positive message to share. Now, Brother Russell comments on this. This is from reprint 1379. He points out that it's the church at the end, that the only ones that can really proclaim good tidings. And this point about get thee up into the high mountain, that's really saying to the church, it's time for you to be ready to make your claim election sure, to take your place in the heavens with Christ, your friends. And then um, at the end of this, uh, I'm going to take the next verse. I'm jumping ahead. Uh, the next portion of the verse says, O Jerusalem that brings good tidings, lift up thy voice uh, with strength. I left strength off there. Lift it up and be not afraid. Uh, well, Jerusalem, Brother Russell brings out, is really talking about those of faith in Israel. It's almost like the church passes the baton. When the church has gotten up in the mountain, the ones that will be preaching good tidings will be the faithful among the Jews who accept the ancient worthies. It's pretty amazing. And it's to say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. They are announcing the same thing. It's time for the kingdom. Uh, and we love this. Lift up your voice with strength. Be not afraid. I think that applies really to, to both. Uh, verse 10 goes on to point out how, you know, the Lord has come. It's really his mighty judgments in the earth. 
And Jesus is there ruling. This is this portion is after, uh, well, I should say it's not totally after. For the Jews, they recognize it after. For us, we see it now. And the recompense, you know, the correction of all of the ills of earth. We heard a sister pray recently, and I was so encouraged by it. She thanked the Lord that the corruption of the earth, the false institutions and all, that he was shortly to take them all out of the way. And I thought, you know, how much do we pray about that sort of thing? Um, but it is a blessing to think all the wrongs will be corrected and taken care of. Uh, verse 11, friends, is very special. And again, we think this is a promise, especially for the feet members. But who shall feed his, his flock like a lamb. My brother Russell comments on that about, well, this is from um, 3rd volume 229 and 230. At the pr present time, we are realizing this promised help to the full extent of our present necessities by being taken into the Heavenly Father's confidence, made acquainted with his plans and assured of his favor and sustaining grace, and being made co-laborers with him. You know, brethren, I, I ask myself, do I really appreciate the favor of the Lord just in understanding what's happening in the earth today and what it portends, the blessings that are coming? Um, okay, we got the wrong one here. It's interesting, it goes on the lambs. The Lord has special care over his little ones, ones that are newer in the truth and so forth, and gently leads those that are with young. There, it's really an um, encouragement to uh, those who have opportunity bringing others to the truth, those that have had chances witnessing, encouraging, and helping. He mentions that, um, you know, teachers and evangelists among the Lord's sheep are particularly mentioned there. Well, friends, maybe one of the most controversial points, but we think it's important just to share, because he, he brings this out in the chapter on the deliverance and exaltation of the church. He mentions the John the Baptist picture being in prison as being a potential example of enforced idleness that the church might come to a point where they're not permitted to uh, continue with sharing the truth with others. I also brings in the Elijah picture of being taken up in the whirlwind. Now, friends, Brother Russell says this in a way that is suggestive, okay? And I think he does that because these are pictures, and we don't know just what will happen. Uh, friends, for myself, my faith looks at this and wonders, you know, why did the Lord put these pictures here? It's so clear that John the Baptist and Elijah in their earlier experiences represent the church. It seems very logical and consistent that their end experiences would also tell us something about the church. But it's something that we have to watch and see. And he quotes there, this is from page 231 where he talks about this. Um he mentions there about Zion need not fear for God is in the midst of her. Um, and he points out the disciple is not above his master. We should never be surprised at any experience the Lord may permit us, brother. You know, trouble is absolutely necessary for the development of the new creation. And it's a real favor. We heard one of the unconsecrated recently make the point how unique it is among the, the brethren, among the, you know, all the religious thinking that the brethren recognize that our experiences are for our development. They're really a blessing. Wouldn't we take them correctly? Everyone else seems to think if you're God, you've got to be favored and have prosperity and good things happen and all of that. So we're in, this is a core lesson, I think, for us in all of our experiences, but especially in our closing experiences, whether they have to do with this enforced idleness or appreciate a sister brought out to me some time ago, seeing her consecrated father go through end of life over a long period of time, how terrible that was. We can under, understand sometimes experiences brethren have in closing. They don't have to be like this, but they can be very deep and proving of our final faithfulness. Well, friends, we wanted to mention um, Isaiah 26, 21, for the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants. Whoops. Come, my people, enter your chambers, shut your doors behind you, hide yourselves a little while until the wrath is passed. Now, this is, I mentioned earlier, reprint 5255. 
he really goes into detail in that article about this. Uh, but friends, this is a reference to the trouble we think of the Laodicean period, and especially um, as we get near the consummation of our hope and things worsen. Uh, and for, for us, we're going to put a picture of a four poster bed here with the curtains, because it's almost in my mind, and this isn't exactly the way the scripture says it, but to me, it, it brings up the point of shutting the doors or closing the curtains are like wrapping yourself in faith. You remember the illustration in the court of the tabernacle, how the curtain was a wall of faith on one side and a wall of unbelief on the other. We, we might read this text and think the Lord is saying, you know, get out of the world, hide yourself away from everything. That's really not the point. The point is you're in a secret place in the most time. You're dwelling in the heavenlies, brethren. Are you doing so by faith? Are you really holding on to those promises? Are you letting the things in the world get to you? You know, uh, what do I mean by that? Brother, we want to have the sympathies for what the world is experiencing. For me, it's wonderful that the Lord, this time is the church is in. Because will the world find comfort that the church went through this period with them? I think it will be very encouraging to them that some understood that. So there's this sympathetic aspect that we have as we things, watch things in the world. But we are not to fear and not to be troubled because we are holding fast to the Lord's promises of the time. So you want to close out doubt and skepticism. That's, I think, part of this. And I like this because the, this illustration, because it would be like the saints are resting in faith on the bed of doctrine. Faith in the two salvations, knowing the permission of evil and how the Lord will overrule that, knowing the ransom and how all encompassing it is. Now, I'll just mention John 17, 11, 14, and 15. Don't you love, friends, that Jesus noted the church would be in the world, but they would not be of the world? And he prayed that we would be protected while in the world. Well, Isaiah 26 goes on to say, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will disclose the bloodshed and will no longer cover its slain. Um, it might seem like a hard scripture, brethren, but it, it really is getting at there is no sin that's ever sinned that won't be corrected, either in this life or the next. Some men's sins go before to judgment, some go after and in that reprint 5255, Brother Russell speaks about how justice really demands this correction, that his justice will do that. He says that justice will get its due, so to speak. Justice will take its pound of flesh. And there's a lot, that, and I can't have time to go into it here, brethren, but there's much that could be said just about the expiation of sins. Um, there's also national sins, and there are other problems that mankind have, but all of that will be corrected. The sins against light against the church, they have a special correction. That's what we mean by the expiation. Um, we've been mentioning promises, and friends, you probably have many that you hold on to. This is a very special one. As I said, Psalm 46, to me, is really speaking about the day that we're living in especially. Um, this picture the Wild Bloods may recognize if you drive into where I live, there's only one way in and one way out, brethren. And when COVID came along, uh, this neighbor put the sign up, and this is what you see on both sides. Every day, going to work, going home from work, I had this reminder, promise mm -hmm. your friends. And this really gets to the point, brethren, the context. Though we see the mountains carried in the midst of the sea, though we see the waves roar and so forth, Therefore, I will not fear. And three times that psalm says, God is our refuge. That again is the secret place of the Most High. Or like that, closing the doors of faith behind you, brethren. This is part of our inheritance, friends, to have this relationship with our Heavenly Father. And you'll find in the chapter on deliverance and exaltation of the church, uh, he references Psalm 46 repeatedly. Um, <clears throat> I really enjoy, this is the Lisa translation, God will ever help her at the dawning of her morning. 
the church's help begins before the world. Brother Russell points out there's a dawning for the church. There's also the sunrise for mankind. Their both thoughts are given uh, in the scriptures. Um, <clears throat> Psalm 110.7 mentions drinking of the brook of the way. We would encourage the friends um, to look at reprint 2936. It's very inspiring. And it is in the context of the Lord striking through kings in the day of his wrath and the judging among the nations. So again, it's another one I think you see in the context, it's specially meant um, for our day. But he says about our experiences there, um, we have to keep drinking and recognizing the Father's will and his will to be done. We have to keep drinking until we rejoice in that, brethren. Very important. And he says, let us continue to give thanks to our Lord for every taste of life's experience, for every lesson, every trial, appropriating them all to our spiritual development. The time for lifting up our heads in glory is nearing too. And already he directs it, seeing with the eye of faith, we lift our heads up. So again, we want to rejoice in tribulation, brethren. This is just a picture of Paul and Silas in prison. And brethren, it's not joyful to the flesh, of course, but it's the idea of what the experiences work out for us. Um, you know, Brother Barton mentioned how we should pray for joy. He noted the brethren in his day weren't praying for that, but that's our privilege too, friends, to pray for that among the other fruits and graces of the Spirit. Uh, this is 5805. We rejoice not in the trouble, which surely saddens every tender heart, but we do rejoice that since the world would be prepared for the grand change of government in no other way than through a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. The Messiah is about to stand forth clothed with divine power, take his reign and bless all the families of the earth. Lastly, friends, just in terms of looking up and lifting up your heads, we wanted to share Hebrews 12, 26 to 28. Speaking of the Heavenly Father, that his voice shook the earth. It's talking about the picture of um, Mount Sinai and the making of the law covenant. And it says, he has promised, this is God has promised, yet once more I will not only shake the earth, but also the heavens. And this word yet once more signifies the removing of the things that are shaken as of things that have been made. It's really things men have created so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. That's talking about the kingdom class, about the church. We go through the same shakings that the world go through, brethren. The one that shakes out the earthly institutions proves the, the church class. They're faithful and they're not removed. And then it says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. I mean, that's the attitude to be ready to receive all the Lord's blessings and his promises. Uh, so uh, fourth volume 150, he comments about this. I'll leave that for, for your reference. But indeed, brethren, just let's all remember it's our privilege to look up, to be very close to our father fully trust him, whatever happens in the world, whatever experiences we have. And make that effort to claim the promises, to lift your head up in all your experiences. May the Lord overrule anything that's spoken.